Welcome to Radiologists, a podcast by University Medical Imaging Toronto, where we discuss the most interesting topics through the lens of Canada's largest medical imaging department. I'm your host, Satish Krishna. Today, we have with you an amazing interventional radiologist, and we just can't bring you any radiologist. It has to be the founding father of the Canadian Association of Intervention Radiology, Dr. Martin Simons. Marty, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So, Marty, like, first things first, when you started radiology, radiology itself was in its infancy. So, how did you end up in interventional radiology? Did it even exist at that point? No, it, it, was, it wasn't something that was on the radar. It's certainly n nothing you learned in medical school. Uh, my inclination in medical school was to either be a family doctor or to be a uh, big city specialist. And if I was a family doctor, be a small town family doctor. And I, and I, in fact, was a small town family doctor and kind of felt I missed the big city life, but I didn't want to be a big city family doctor. I wanted to, if I figured if I was going to come back to the city, I'd be a specialist. And I was always inclined towards surgery and my, my role models were surgeons and, um, they, they, their lifestyles put me off. The residencies were very difficult. The call was very difficult and the, um, Divorce rate and unhappiness seemed very high in my mentors, the ones I had looked up to. And as I was going through, radiology didn't have CT scan, didn't have real-time ultrasound, didn't have MR. And as I went through medical school, like from 76 to 80, ultrasound, first real-time ultrasound came out in 1980. First CT scanner was 1975. And of course, Canada was five years behind and everything. So, you know, the Americans had CT scanners in 75. We didn't start getting them until the late 70s. So as I was coming through, here was CT coming, MR was just on its way, real-time ultrasound. And general surgery, which was what I was interested in, seemed like it was a dead specialty. So I thought, hey, this is the most dynamic specialty going. I'm going to go into radiology. And um, the appeal of running a clinic and being independent appealed to me. Um, but I, I trained in Vancouver, and Vancouver was the mecca for interventional radiology at that time. Hans Joachim Berhanna was the chair, and he was the first non-vascular interventional radiologist in the world. He developed a technique for removing gallstones from T-tube tracts with a basket and the wow. Berhanna catheter, and he was the first ever. Before that, there was no non-vascular interventional radiology. There was just angiographers. And so <clears throat> he got me interested, and the, the head of ultrasound, Peter Cooperberg, was a very dynamic guy and very interested in intervention, biopsies, nephrostomies, abscess drainages, everything with ultrasound. Okay. So it, it, didn't, it didn't take long for me to see that this was the cutting edge, and I always thought, if you're going to be a specialist, you don't want to do what people were doing in the past. You want to be doing what no one's done yet. So you want to do the new thing that's coming along. And I think if laparoscopy had come along a year earlier, I would have done general surgery. But there was no laparoscopy, and radiology was just so much more dynamic than anything else. Uh, so I went into that, and then I just got sucked in the vacuum into interventional radiologists. There was no um, buddy to learn from. It was such a wow. new specialty. Uh, That's so interesting, because when I speak with a lot of uh, other radiologists, we also had uh, Dave Nicholas here, and when in that stage of the career, when I asked, how did he end up in radiology? The common answer seems that I was at a fork in my road to see if I wanted to do something which everyone was doing or take the load, uh, road less traveled. And radiology was the road less traveled and I took that. But in your case, interventional radiology, there was no road. <laughs> you literally created the road and then decided to travel in the road, which is just amazing. It goes to show what kind of a person you are, a man of action, create roads where there aren't any roads. I think that we were, I wouldn't say, I might have been a, a leader in Canada, but certainly I was following many leaders internationally. Yeah. Um, there was a lot going on in Europe and the United States. So interventional radiology, the name and everything was established. Not, not so much, but the ideas, Charles Dodder back in the 60s talked about um, clinicians as radiologists as clinicians and separating from radiology 
and taking ownership of patients and not just doing special procedures. Because when I started, that's what we called it, special procedures. The patient oh, what's called special procedures? Yeah. All of anything that wasn't done at a light box was a special procedure. Oh, so who? So an did IVP you... was a special procedure because you had to start an IV. Ah. Or a biopsy, we didn't do biopsies, but uh, silograms, myelograms, oh, okay. translumbarians, those were called special procedures. And in fact, it was a rotation. You'd come and you might do a myelogram in the morning and a silogram at lunch, and you know that would be like your day. It would just be, and you met the patient right before you did the consent, you did the procedure, and you had no idea what happened afterwards. No follow up. <laughs> so, so who named it interventional radiology? And like, why you involved in naming? Because the name. I don't know about you. The name seems always a little bit odd to me. What do, what do we call it's it? A terrible, radiology? terrible name. I hate the name. It's two words that you can't, it's like fish bicycle. It's just two words that have no purpose being in the same sentence. Charles' daughter called us interventional radiology. Okay. And Charles' daughter was like Da Vinci. He was way ahead of his time. He talked about um, biodegradable stents back in the 60s. And we're, we used, KT put in the first biodegradable stent in Canada this week. Oh, wow. So, like, wow. So it's 60 years yeah, ahead of time. Yeah, you talk about vectors, uh, you know, um, uh, putting uh, chemotherapy on particles and injecting it. He talked about all that stuff. Stents, balloons, everything before it was developed. Amazing. So, and he said we should call ourselves interventional radiologists. So the name stuck. It was yeah. one of his few mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you realize that it was like uh, it was a budding specialty, and when did you realize in your career that you were established? Now, was it something to do with like beginning of the clinics, and uh, or, or or when would you say that? Well, when I was in Vancouver, r interventional radiologists were very thick on the ground. Everybody wanted to do interventional radiology. We had more graduates than we had jobs, so it was it was I couldn't get a job in Vancouver because there were only two places and they were full. So yeah, people were all leaving. Uh, Lindsay McCann was there. He left. He went back, but he he left for a while. And so I looked around and. When I came to Toronto, Gordon Potts had great vision. And um, and when he became chair, he said, I'm not going to the general, I'm going to the Western. And he told all the radiologists there, he you can be academic or you can have your clinics and go. And at least half of the radiologists took their clinics and left. And what was left was Carl Terbrug and Professor Mima and Ken Vassal, the, the, true, interven the true academic stayed. And then he went on a hiring spree and I was part of that hiring spree. So when I went to look at the job, he was very much, any, what do you want? Like, what do you need to come here? And what's, what's it going to be? And I said, well, I got to speak to the chief of surgery. So I went to see the chief of surgery and it was Bob Stone, who was the guy I was, who had me convinced to do general surgery. <laughs> and he remembered me and he, and he said, um, what's the story? He said, well, I'm going to come if, if I'm going to be supported. I'm not going to come if the surgeons are going to do open liver biopsies and if abscesses are going to get drained uh, surgically and if the vascular surgeons aren't going to send me angioplasties. I want to, I want to know what the support is. And he said, well, you're going to have all the support you want. So you can have everything you want. And if anybody gives you a hard time, you come and see me because he was chief of surgery. And I had great support from day one. It was an instant practice and no, just positive reinforcement, never any you shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, the only, the only pushback I ever got was from diagnostic radiologists. So that's really interesting to hear because quite a lot of interventional radiologists across the world always complain the same thing because when it initially was a budding specialty, probably no one was interested, but once it is well established and it comes with the spotlight and limelight, now everyone wants to do it, including the surgeons and the clinicians. They're like, oh, why don't we do it? Did you have to face these tough battles at all? It seems like you had it, had it pretty good here. No, I've been very lucky. I think I've been very lucky. The cardiologists often were trained in the States and could do peripheral, but the chief of cardiology said, we don't have the funding to leave the coronary artery. So no, we, we used to do renal angioplasties before the coral trial. And um, the chief of cardiology told the cardiologists, we're not spending money on renal stents. We're spending money on coronary stents. All your, you know, if you if we if you see a renal artery stenosis, you got to send it to the radiologists. So uh, there was there were factors in our favor. Uh, there were people who wanted my job, but um, didn't get support. Yeah, no one could compete chief. with you, Marty. No one can compete with well, you. Well, they couldn't get the budget. I mean, we did have times when we didn't have the budget, and 
and and it is the rule, the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Um, we got the uh, gastrostomy business because we had we took we spent the money on them on the gastrostomies and the gastroenterologists were reluctant to blow their budget on it and now they regret that but um is, is that one of the main challenges in ir like the availability of funds and budgets oh yeah budget i mean in all of canadian medicine it doesn't matter what you do i mean um but interventional radiology is in a little bit of a more problematic position so there's never enough money for the growth of medicine. People are getting older, people are getting sicker, we're keeping them alive, and, and keeping them alive is a more expensive proposal than, than ever before. Um, so getting money for medical imaging is hard to buy more CTs, to buy MRs, but then you know, we run them as a business. We're fee-for-service, we're, we're charging. And if you give the chief of radiology $2 million and you say, what do you want to do with it? And you say, I want to buy an MR because that's going to bring in a lot of income and it's something we're short of. It's not like buying MR is a bad idea. But then you say, well, what about IR? He says, well, it's going to cost me $2 million for the room and it's going to cost me another million a year in disposables and I'm going to have to hire nurses and techs and it's inefficient and it doesn't pay that well. So there's, there's all kinds of... Um, rules in the game that are against IR. The, 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 the pay is average, it's not great, and the cost of the overhead is, is much higher than in any other area in, in, in medical imaging. Um, we've been fortunate that years ago, one of the chiefs was able to get IR as a separate line item so that there wasn't a competition within UMIC over whether the money should go for gadolinium or, or catheters. Okay. They were two separate budgets and was something we couldn't fight over. That's not the case in most groups. Okay. So if, if I had advice to give for a radiologist in chief who wants to keep some peace in the family is separate the budget so that you can't fight <laughs> over it. But yeah, like I understand at least CT and MR, once you get the uh, infrastructure in place, it doesn't cost that much more money, whereas IR, you guys have all these catheters and fancy equipment and tiny, tiny coils, which cost a lot of money. Very but expensive. that said, did, how, did they all exist when you started? And how were they created? Like, no, was the, when, when I started, we were, I don't know if you ever watched the show MacGyver. It was probably well before your time, but there's a saying. It's like a late 80s, MacGyver, 90s show. Where this guy was like a super spy and he could make a bomb out of a paperclip kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> so we called ourselves MacGyvers because we used to take all kinds of products and use them off label. And we, wow. and we got away with it. It was all accepted. And for instance, um, balloons were only allowed in the iliac arteries. Well, we put them in the ureters and then bile duct strictures. We put balloons all over the place. So you were at the cutting edge of stuff. You kind of well, pump. lots of people did it. I was, I was just in the, in the group as it were. Um, so we were using lots of stuff off label and making up a lot of operations in a way that probably wouldn't stand up to medical scrutiny. Now I needed to do a few more lab animals and stuff before you come in. With the, we were a little more, not me, but the, the specialty as a whole was a, quite uh, aggressive at making up new things. But looks like you've been, uh, incredibly satisfied with how things turned out. What? What drew you to intervention and what kept you so happy? Is it, is it the adrenaline rush which comes along with it? Or is it that dopamine hit? Because as radiologists, diagnostic radiologists, we are on the sidelines. We point when things go wrong and then somebody slowly fixes it for us. And I remember during my uh, third year in which one day when I was doing an interventional procedure, my staff couldn't be there and he said, why don't you go ahead and do it? It was a uterine artery embolization for a patient with postpartum hemorrhage. The patient came in extremely sick and pale. And the second I embolized, immediately the vitals stabilized, everything went back to normal. And it's still one of the top three feelings I ever had. I felt so satisfied. Yeah. Is that what kept you going? Because you could have just been a diagnostic radiologist. Like, was no. it the adrenaline rush or a dopamine hit that? For sure, the um, procedural side was, 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 the, was the most fun in my career of all the things I've done. I like diagnostic radiology enough, but... For sure, I, if I had to do one thing all day, I'd be doing procedures. Procedures all day. Yeah. And you also do diagnostics and you do yeah. procedures. Is the approach different? As in, do you approach diagnostic 
different than how you would approach an intervention. As in, when you do diagnostics, you're meticulous looking at like tiny things, intervention, big picture, action. Is, is there like a different part of your brain you switch on and switch off for different things? You shouldn't be. I think that that's one of the weaknesses of our diagnostic residencies is that we don't teach people how to put in a practical opinion. We're very good at measuring nodules and writing a long differential, but we don't add value in the opinion. I read so many of these reports that are dead accurate and add no value at the bottom. They just relist the findings and suggest clinical correlation. And I don't think it's because I'm an interventional radiologist. I think it's just my, my opinion, my, my personality, because I have plenty of great partners, including you, who do add, who write beautiful reports and do add value. But I think that, yeah, I, yeah I you guess have that, to add value. It's I, not just a matter of seeing everything. Okay, I guess, I guess that comes with training residents and the training the trainees right from an early age. And speaking about training, I understand that you've established one of the most successful fellowship programs in the country. And I've spoken to a lot of fellows and they absolutely seem to love you. How is training different then compared to now? Because now I see that you guys have all these fancy simulators to train and stuff. And uh, how did you set it up and how have things evolved over time? Well, I think that <clears throat> the reason our, our program's successful is because of the 10 of us, not just me. I mean, um, <clears throat> I've been able to hire people who are all smarter than me. I haven't got a single partner who's not smarter than I am. And that's, that's the key to success is to surround yourself with smarter people. Uh, a rising tide rises, raises all boats. So that's been my philosophy. And um, the, the fellows give you a lot back. They, they keep you on your toes and they're a pleasure. To, they make coming in fun, right? So there's, it's a win-win from that point of view. Um, I think our, our fellowship program was successful because it is old school. There's a, um, <clears throat> an argument in, in medical teaching, is residency school or is it apprenticeship? And CARMS will say, no, it's school. You're here to, to learn. You're not here to apprentice. And I, I, I fundamentally disagree. I think that you should read all your books at night and come prepared to work. But in the daytime, you should be apprenticing. In other words, reading the films, answering the phone, um, protocoling the CTs, doing the IV, in, IV injections or putting in the pick lines, whatever needs to be done to run the department so that when you're finished, you just go out and you work and you've done all these things. And it's a natural That's project. literally why it's called residency, right? You just reside there and you just work there. So our fellowship is based on that, is that you're there to work, you're there to to do the procedures with the perfect amount of guidance, which I think we have a nice balance in our program. And um, and I speak for the other nine, there's 10 of us, and, and they're all really good teachers and they're all committed to the fellows. Um, and the fellows feel like they're, they're, they're getting huge amount of experience, but not left like you were with the uterine artery embolization going, what do I do next? <laughs> so there's that, con you know, it's, it's a fine line between how much responsibility is safe for the patient and, and how do you, how do you teach um, a trainee to have a little bit of pressure so that they have to make their own mind up and not look to you for the answers? That's absolutely amazing. One thing you're speaking about is how you are a part of team and how all the people in your group are better than you. Now, I've spoken to most of them, and I can tell you that every single one of them look up to you. And if you tell me that they are all better than you, the only thing I can say is it goes to show how incredibly smart you are in hiring the right people. How do you know if somebody is fit for intervention radiology or diagnostic? Is there a sorting hat you put on them and you're like, okay, he can be an intervention radiologist? Yeah. Or you, do you see him see uh, do a procedure and then you're like, okay, he's good. Is it known day one? It's not all technical skill. In fact, um, one of my best partners was very average when he started. He's outstanding now, but it took him an extra year in practice to catch up. So it's not 100% technical. Um, it's, it's having um, a solid mind and an independent way of thinking. In other words, to, to you know, synthesize information and come up with your own decision, not, not just follow the pack. I, I like that. And, 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 and leadership's important. I think that... Um, at UMIC, more than any other place, you have to have leadership abilities to be a radiologist. You can't just come in and, you know, you can go to the community and just read films and not have any leadership skills, and that's fine. But I don't think that works at the university level. I think you have to have 
teaching skills and leadership skills and administrative skills. There's a whole other part of our job that people don't that, that you that you assume when you when you come on staff at our place. And uh, so we look for that. I look for collegiality, um, and I look for people who aren't going to try to hoard the glory, who aren't afraid of competition or confident and not threatened easily. That's amazing because when we talk about diagnostic radiology, we're talking about miss rates, how good a radiologist they are, and how good an eye they have. But from your leadership style, at least on interventional radiology side, it seems that the intangibles are more important as to what kind of person they are. Are they a good clinician? Are they a good colleague? And maybe those are what makes a good interventional radiologist. That is amazing. That's great to hear. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, I was always told in surgery, and I think the same with IR, you can teach the skills. They're, you push, you pull, you turn left, you turn right. It's, that's all there is <laughs> to it. It's not, you know, there's a bit of hand-eye coordination. And and I think that's why changing, so I think that's why radiologists make the best interventional radiologists. I said, why don't surgeons learn this stuff and get good at it? They can't, or they can, but I, I believe in this sort of gene, uh, the 3D gene, I call it. Mm -hmm. people like you and I can look at a, an axial CT scan and see a round dot and know that that's the aorta and it's tubular. You look at that and you say, oh yeah, that's tubular. It's running through the body and it's running right here. Yeah. And we take it for granted that everybody else sees that. Mm. That's actually a, a gift. It's like hitting a golf ball or hitting a baseball. It's not something everybody can do. Like Radiologists, I think, self-select because they have that ability to build 3D models in their head. They've got that extra genetic ability that not everybody has. And I think that really, so being a good clinician, having the personality, being committed to patient care and follow up and, and being very meticulous in, you know, in what you're doing and being a friendly person so you can deal with other clinicians, that's all good. But, and, and surgeons all have that. But not all surgeons have that ability to put an ultrasound probe on their hand, look over here, and put a needle into a lesion without looking. Yep. And you, you look and you laugh and say, well, that's not that hard. It's because you have that gene. And, you know, and I can't hit a golf ball. I've been trying for years. <laughs> and I'll never hit a golf ball well. And my son picks up the club and hits it farther and straighter the first time out. Wow. So, the, the, you know, but there's, I think I have that gift for 3D imaging. And I think that's. Oh, I've never thought about it like that because surgeons are looking at what they're operating. But when I'm doing biopsies or when you're doing interventions, you're looking at a screen. You're not even looking here, but you're still able to do that, which and is And you've incredible. gone over scans with clinicians and you say, well, there's the aorta. And they go, I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, you know, that you, well, you three go, dimensional well, thinking and spatial orientation. I think we kind of innately, inherently have it. And I think that uh, is just great. Yeah. Um, so, you started when it was called technical procedures. You've established interventional radiology. You've established a training program. You've hired the best people around you. Where do you see the specialty going next? Where, what is going to be the next evolution of it? We talk about AI and stuff. Is it going to augment what you do? Is it going to replace? A, what are the next uh, cutting edge technologies th coming in? So I think that, you know, surgery started that surgeons took out gallbladders and fixed femurs, right? They did ortho general surgeons did orthopedics. I think interventional radiology will split up. There'll be people doing interventional oncology. There'll be people who just do AVMs or, and that there may be a call group, just like there is in surgery, where you might get called to do certain core things at night. But in the daytime, you will have a sub-subspecialty in IR. I think it's going to split up. And not even myself, I don't do interventional oncology. Um, when it came along, I just said, you guys do it. I've got, I'm, I'm busy enough, and this is, a big, this is a big piece of pie. I'll let you guys split it up. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the things is the future. And then the relationship between diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology may change. I, I don't know. There's a strong feeling from people I respect that we should stay within radiology, that, that interventional radiology shouldn't split up. And, you know, right now when we established the, the residency, we, we made it a requirement that you had to be a diagnostic radiologist to become an interventional radiologist. It's the only pathway. Um, 
but from from the from the problem of um, funding, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the the natural um, problem that arises when you when there's competition for money between diagnostic and interventional radiology, it doesn't create good relationships. Um, so we we'll certainly have to separate the budgets, and then radiology groups are now up to hundred people, and do we really need to have? I think even in our group now, each division has almost become its own group, independent, just like medicine. You know, cardiology and nephrology don't have dinner parties together, right? It's, and it's the same. We don't, uh, we don't have dinner parties with the breast imagers, and then they're, you know, we hardly ever get together as a group. It's really very much broken down into divisions, and I think that's that's the future in all of radiology. Wow. Do you think uh, that? When surgeons, they have these robotics in which they can stay in a different room and do a surgery in a different room. Something like that would ever be possible in intervention radiology in which you're sitting here or like maybe sipping pina colada in Bahamas and then, you know, doing a procedure on somebody somewhere else. Well, we have done that in uh, Zimbabwe where we have a robot in our Phillips room and a trained radiologist hooked up, punctured the femoral artery, put the catheters in, hooked up the robot. Okay. And then handed over the controls to the radiologist in Toronto, and they did the procedure. And then they'd say, "Well, load me a number six coil." Wow! And so the the neuroradiologist it was the neuroradiology they were doing. It was the coiling aneurysms. He would load the coil in the catheter, and then the radiologist in Toronto would deploy it. So you you can do stuff like that. Um, but that how incredible. do you afford a robot? In Zimbabwe, when you can fly someone in for a few thousand dollars, and okay, um, I much see foresee the future is um, is like what I'm doing is where I go to Africa for two weeks and batch a bunch of services and then leave for a while. Oh, so is that what you're doing? After yeah, after I've, I've retired now, but I got my license back so I can go to Uganda with a group called Road to IR. It's run out of Yale University, um, Fabian. Lo- Labage, perhaps his name. Sorry about that. Um, but the, he organizes this special uh, this um, charity, and they provide interventional radiologists, nurses, and techs. And we go into they've been to Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda, and I'm going to Uganda. And uh, there are radiologists there who want some training, so I'm going to teach them to do some basic IR. Wow! So even after retirement. You know, nobody can take the intervention radiology out of you. You're still going to I'm, establish more inter- intervention radiology practices across the world in uh, underserved nations, I guess. I'm quite happy being retired, but this is sort of interesting thing I do. It. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, speaking of being happy, do you miss the spotlight? No. <laughs> no. I, um, I've always feared hanging around too long. I, lo- I look at Lionel Messi, who said after he won the World Cup, he says, I'm never going to play in another World Cup. Oh, okay. okay. Perfect, right? The guy's <laughs> right on top, and he's walking away. He can come back in four years and be a third-string player, right? But, you know, who wants to be Yeah. that? I, I mean, some people, a lot of athletes do that, but I think interventional radiology is a bit of an athletic thing. I mean, you get <laughs> older and tighter, and you c- can't do it as well as you yeah. get older. It's it's harder than diagnostic physically, especially wearing the lead aprons, which weigh like what twenty five pounds, and yeah. for four hour procedures. It's certainly a more physical, uh, more demanding than diagnostic radiology physically, and so yeah, I wanted to get out before. Uh, I want to go out on top, I, and I'd plan that for my twenties. I never wanted to um, hang around and too long. Too long. Wow, it kind of reminds me, like in Indian cricket, there was this uh, legendary all-rounder, Kapil Dev. He was retiring at the peak of his career, and uh, one of the journalists asked him, why? And he replied, I'm not going to wait until you ask me why not. Hmm. So that's just great that uh, 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 you managed to establish it, and then now you're leaving it to the next generation to carry forward. In your career, as a radiologist, I think it's about 37 years of radiology. About that, yeah. That's a legendary and a long career. What are the lessons learned and what lessons, what advice would you give to the budding radiologists and intervention radiologists of tomorrow? Um, 
Well, you've made the first deci- good decision going into radiology. <laughs> <laughs> Marry the right partner <laughs> and buy land on the edge of town. But uh, those are the best few things you could do. But um, do what you like, not what you think is going to make you money. Or um, I, I think that we, we, we make a decent living in radiology, even at the bottom end of and everybody wants to make what's at the top end. But I think if you look at what you're making at the, at the lower end of what radiology is making Canada, if that's not enough, you have a spending problem. <laughs> and so I think you should go for the job you like. And in fact, you end up making more money because you end up working harder because you're enjoying it more. And it, it all works together. I think people worry about, we get focused in, we get goal oriented. Uh, medical school is very goal oriented. How do I get into medical school? I got to do volunteer work. I got to get straight A's. And you have all these set goals all your life about how you're going to do things. And you're not doing things because you want to do them. You're doing them because there's the goals you've set out for yourself. It's a slightly different mindset. And I think once you're in, once you're through med school, that's the competition part is is gone, right? As long as you pass, you're you're going to be fine. So do what you like. That's amazing advice. And uh, as an interventional radiologist, I think that uh, in addition to all the technical skills, just be a well-rounded person, I guess, like be a good clinician. Or not, whatever you feel like. (laughs) (laughs) No one can tell you. That's amazing. Follow your heart, follow your passion, and create your own road wherever you are and uh, do the best in life, I guess. Amazing. So for those of you who are listening, That was Dr. Martin Simons. And that was incredible advice and an incredible legendary career, which he has led. And after that, I'm inspired. And if I want to do it all over again, I might end up being an interventional radiologist. The world is divided into two, thinkers and doers. In radiology, the diagnostic radiologists are more thinkers. you can liken diagnostic radiologists to detectives like Sherlock Holmes. We have cases, we have puzzles, we have little clues which we put together slowly, meticulously to crack the case. Whereas intervention radiologists are like the action heroes. They're right in the center, they're the center of attention, like Ethan Hunt or Jason Bourne. And uh, yeah, they get things done. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Martin Simons who has led an extraordinary career, an intervention radiologist, who is now retired, but is still an intervention radiologist. And me, your host, Satish Krishna. Thank you. See you on the next one.